Welcome to South Asian Environment Dialogue. This is a program where we, for the last five months or so, we are discussing various facets of climate change and environment in this part of the world. And as South Asia is a critical part of the world, so we are actually discussing the global issues on environment and climate change. And today we'll be again discussing another very critical issues. Before introducing the subject, let me share with you that you all know, but still share with you that this is now perhaps the one and only of its kind program in South Asia talking about environment and climate change is brought on by the Canadian television channel Climate Channel in association with the Indian media platform, The Plurals, and also NoTB Bangla, a Bangladeshi YouTube channel. Now, today we are going to discuss climate change, big threat, little money. This is an issue being so often being discussed across the table. And today we are also going to discuss that. Before coming into the issue and introducing the subject for you, let me introduce a very, very eminent panel that we have with us today. Let me start with Nilanjan Ghosh, Dr. Nilanjan Ghosh. Nilanjan Ghosh is the director of Observer Research Foundation, uh, mm -hmm. Kolkata, a major think tank of South Asia. And he works in various areas, but one of the major area of work is ecological economics. And uh, I really, really privileged to have Nilanjan in this today's show. Welcome Nilanjan to the show. Pleasure, pleasure indeed. Thank you. Uh, I have with me Onumita Roy Choudhury. Onumita is the executive director of Center for Science and Environment, CAC, one of the, I think, the global major on, on this kind of environment and climate issues. And she is working on the air pollution sector and also the related sectors, not only in India, but across, I think, in other parts of South Asia and also in Africa as well. So. Onumita, it's such a, such a privilege to have you again in this show. And we are really, really would like to know from you that what's happening in this budget and how this budget is impacting or is going to impact the future of India. Welcome, Onumita. Greetings to everyone. Very happy to be here. Thank you. We have with us Professor Kaji Khalikudjaman Ahmed. He's the chairman, Dhaka School of Economics, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh, and is one of the major, major I think the expert in this region talking about climate change, particularly the financial part of it. And it's such another privilege to have you, Professor Ahmed. And we are really, really keen to know what's happening in South Asia, especially in Bangladesh from you on this area of kind of climate finance or the kind of related issues like that. Welcome, welcome to thank, the show. Thank you very much and hello to everybody. Thank you. And finally, but last but not the least, very, very importantly, uh, Ms. Khadija Naseem, uh, she is the Deputy Director, Deputy Minister of Environment Maldives and also a very eminent expert on climate finance. So such a, such a, such a welcome uh, kind of, I think, uh, attributes, a, a politician coupled with the expertise on ground. And very rarely we do find that and such a privilege to host you in this today's program, madam. Uh, I, I, we are really, really, really keen to know what's happening in Maldives. Only we talk about Maldives in terms of tourism, that's very important, but climate change wise, Maldives is extremely threatened. So really would like to know from you how the things are going out in Maldives. Welcome to the show. So that's the panel for me today. Uh, before I go over, I'll start with, because the Indian budget has recently been announced. And as I said, today we are going to talk about the budgetary allocations and the related issues on environment, climate change, and also, also the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals uh, in this region. We often talk about that the bigger countries are not giving money to us, but are we actually giving money ourselves to these issues? That's a very, very important question to understand and I think track. Uh, before I go over to first Nilanjan and then Onumita to talk about the Indian budget and what they think about it, uh, let me share with you that in this year, Indian budget, uh, in all, around 3,000 crores being allotted to the Environment Ministry, which is even less than 1%. And that money has gone down uh, 
compared to the last year. Now, many may say that in the aftermath of COVID, it is what was always expected on the line. But still, how can you how can you explain only 30 crores being allotted to climate action plan this year? And if you say that, okay, COVID was the reason, I will counter saying that last year when there was no COVID, it was 40 crores. So no big deal about that. So from that on, let me go to Nilanjan. Nilanjan, how you see this budget, especially from the environment and climate change point of view? In fact, uh, prior to uh, coming to this, let, let me first thank you for inviting me. And uh, also, it's, it's indeed a privilege for me to be among uh, uh, a group of uh, panelists, which uh, it's, it's, it's an August ga gathering. In fact, uh, so th thanks a lot to South Asian Environment Dialogue and to you, Mr. Basu. But before I get into the budget, in fact, what I also felt at times is that uh, there is a complete disassociation in some way or the other, as far as we look at our uh, development paradigm. Somehow climate or climate action has not been thought of as an integral component of our development paradigm. And this comes up again and again, whenever, whenever any, any type of uh, comment or remark comes out or any kind of response comes out from the finance ministry or suppose say from uh, our planning agencies like Niti Aayog. Now, as an economist, if I look at climate change, I look at it as a cost, purely as a cost. Now, cost to whom? Of course, there have been a host of measures which have come out ever since the uh, Stern assessment way back in 2005 6 at the beginning of the millennium, that uh, in terms of cost to the GDP, true, fine. But what happens is what we often miss out, and this never appears in any kind of uh, global assessments or the global dialogues cost that essentially climate change imposes on the poor in the form of losses to the ecosystem services. Because in all ways, in, uh, one has to remember one thing that there is an inequitable distribution of the impacts of climate change, as far as the rich and the poor are concerned. Yes. <clears throat> one of the very critical things in here is that, that uh, when we look at uh, climate change, when we look at ecosystem services, uh, of course, one very critical element is that the land loss is happening. In fact, we are witnessing sea level rise because of global warming. And on the other hand, we are losing out on the very, very critical supporting services, regulating services, and eventually the provisioning services of the ecosystem on which the poor are directly reliant on. So uh, one very critical element that comes to my mind in here is that which uh, Pavan Sukhda mentioned, in fact, uh, in 2009 in his paper in Nature, that these ecosystem services are nothing but GDP of the poor. In fact, this has come out in my assessments as well when I looked at the ecosystem dependency index, ecosystem dependencies of the poor. What I found is that they extract more from the ecosystem than what they get from, uh, the, uh, from the economic activity, from the economy as such. So suppose say if, uh, uh, say if, if, if the poor is getting 100 rupees from the economy, to some kind of an economic endeavor. He is possibly drawing at times 120 rupees from the ecosystem when we put across a monetary value yes. to these ecosystem services. So when you lose out on these ecosystem services because of the forces of climate change, essentially you are hitting on the GDP of the poor. This so you feel that this trend has continued in this it has continued. last budget? It, it, it is actually continuing. And, and as far as this last budget is concerned, you're absolutely right. In the budget speech, if you recall, there was no statement on climate change, despite the fact it's, if you look at uh, the six pillars, the first, except for the first pillar on governance, which where essentially FM uses the term minimum uh, government, maximum governance. Governance, yes. Except for the sixth pillar, all the five pillars are embedded in the SDGs. You talk of physical capital, you talk of health, you talk of education, sure. hmm. but what is being critically missed out is that one wave of the ocean is going to wipe out your physical capital. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is going to and wipe you out not, your development. And, and you are not acknowledging it. You are not your acknowledging budget. it. And that, is, that is why if you look at the SDGs, climate action is one of the SDGs. So, so if you, if you, one very critical element, if you look at SDGs, is that it embeds four capitals very critically. One is the natural capital, the physical capital, the social capital, and human capital. And 
at the same time it talks of climate action why so that it enables the movement of these four capitals until without another... that without that critical cog the whole thing goes missing absolutely exactly. i think that's a very important part i'll come back to you but let's go to onumita onumita let's be a devil's advocate all said and done some amount has been allotted to air pollution in 42 cities though the amount has been halved compared to last year and we really do not know how the amount was spent last year in the first place there was some amount on the renewable energy but very really kind of a, a i think pockets of release like that so how you see how you perceive as an as a practicing environmentalist how you see this by anumita absolutely so join the first i mean congratulations to you for putting this platform together for this very critical conversation and as nilanjan has already put the big context the big picture uh, uh, you know on the table and uh, that clearly gives us the whole reason to uh, you know that why we now need to look at green budgeting the you know the reason for that so to answer your question let's first keep one point in mind that this is actually the first budget after the unprecedented economic shock that we have experienced due to the pandemic this is also the first budget of this decade this decade which is now looking for transformational changes right now at the same time this budget has come at a time when during the pandemic the lockdown and all the economic recovery packages that we have got at the same time we have also seen lowering of environmental safeguards so several environmental regulations were weakened right now that's the context of this budget this year and clearly the expectation that we had that while certainly we need a budget for economic recovery but it had to be green recovery and that's the lesson that we have been learning from across the regions everywhere mm-hmm. we are finding that while the governments are giving economic recovery uh, designing economic recovery packages they are also making it conditional with social and environmental conditions attached to that so that was the expectation now from that perspective what are the hits and what are the misses in this budget that's what we really want to understand so what have we got yes you are right we have got a clean air fund and this is for the first time that started last year that we have started to get dedicated funding for clean air action but what we need to keep in mind that this new funding that has come which started last year with the allocation of 4400 crore in the last budget that has got split into these two installments so the last year we got half of that amount in november it was too late maybe because of you know all the pandemic etc that we understand now, but therefore at this moment it's too early for us to say what happened because of that spending because there is no review or anything available at this stage and now the next half has come this year now what this essentially means is that this money has come because of the 15th finance commission's recommendation for the urban local bodies and this money was given to 42 cities mm-hmm. right to do their work now the split is that while the urban local bodies are getting this money to do the cleaner action but the 122 cities who are doing cleaner action under the ncap program that program still remains grossly underfunded so, and it was a very marginal increase in this budget so clearly now the next big question for us in the clean air fund is that now we have to start talking about performance based budget because every time when we look at any money that comes for clean air action and the action taken report that the cities file that only talks about mechanical sweeping of roads sprinklers they do not talk about infrastructure systemic changes clean fuel technology changes i mean though and therefore the new money has to fix that that's the first lesson mm. the second part of the budget is yes we have got stimulus package this year one is a scrappage policy for old vehicles and but we do not know yet the fine prints of that scrappage policy how effective that is going to be we are waiting for that policy to come now what we hear that this is voluntary and maybe there is no active incentive maybe the entire policy is based on only disincentive 
So we do not know how many vehicles it will actually end up scrapping. So we do not know. The second test, which is very important, that is something we had really asked for, is a stimulus package for the public transport. So the buses and the other forms of public transport, which is important because that has was literally decimated during the last uh, uh, year during the pandemic. So that is good. And the final, now this is all about what we have got and also the waste uh, uh, management. That is a big chunk of money. And that is a huge co-benefit of clean air and climate. Sure. But what have we missed? The missing is, which Nilanjan also pointed out, that the climate change agenda, right, certainly has not been addressed, especially looking at it from the climate adaptation perspective. Mm -hmm. At least for mitigation, what has been given for clean air is all has a core benefit for climate. But for adaptation, especially in our country, after all the devastating uh, cyclones that we have seen, okay, so that and the agricultural resilience that was required at this moment, so that agenda is missing. And the energy agenda, which is so important, especially renewable energy, only thing that we have got is to reduce the, uh, to increase the import duty on renewable mm -hmm. energy technology so that we can do localization and do exactly. that. Exactly. Now this Atma Nirbhar agenda is important, but without setting targets, when we know that India had set a target of 175 gigawatt of RE by 2021, but we have only been able to achieve 91 so far. And at the same time, we have increased our ambition to 450 gigawatt by... Absolutely. Prime Minister Absolutely. announced it. Prime Minister announced it. No less than Prime Minister. Where is the template and the blueprint to achieve that? So clearly what I'm saying is that to just end here right now, then I'll take up a lot more, that this budget, even though we have got some good, um, I will not deny that, there are certainly some good points. We have to leverage that. But... It is still very focused on the immediate relief and survival. It is still not, you know, ambitious enough to talk about trans creative way of achieving transformational changes. Absolutely, and, and I think I think with also the ambition part is coming up so greatly in context to Glasgow, the later this year, and the entire world is talking about the increased ambition about cutting the kind of emission carbon emission. So I think it was expected that Indian government would have perhaps invested more in that. We'll be discussing that, but let's go to Bangladesh because you mentioned adaptation and that's the adaptation, I, I would say the capital in the world. Uh, Professor Khalid Jaman Saab, what your take? Because I am seeing the Bangladesh budget, it is around 7.5%, the last budget of yours, 7.5% uh, of the budget was allotted to environment. So that's a good one. And in fact, I have seen that, uh, I think the experts, uh, including you have said, it's a good budget on an environmental point of view, but we need to be honest with the spending. That's a very, very interesting operative word, honest with the spending. So how you take on the Bangladesh and Bangladesh budget and its usage? Professor. Thank you very much. Um, I agree with the larger picture that has been given by two of uh, two Indian speakers. Uh, Climate change is an existential threat to humanity and even the globe itself. So that has to be kept in perspective when we discuss uh, climate change and environment also. Now, Bangladesh is at the forefront, as you know, of uh, the climate change impact. And it has been said that the poor are affected most. And therefore the government and international community, they don't feel it immediately. That's not immediate for them. But for the poor people, they, it is immediate, but they can't articulate and can't reach the government. So there is that's this disconnect is there. Therefore, you find actions which are not adequate or not quite relevant that has happened. No, but in Bangladesh, of course, we are fortunate um, in the sense that we had this uh, Climate, Bangladesh Climate Change Strategy and Action Plan that was prepared in 2009. It is now being revised, I should say. There is a draft which will be finalized very soon. And we have six pillars under it. And the six pillars are food security that has to be ensured, and then infrastructure. Then um, mitigation, of course, uh, we have that as well, and low carbon development, disaster management, capacity building, and research and knowledge management. These are the six heads under which we discuss our policies and also action programs. 
Now we have an allocation this year of 24,226 crore taka, yes, that's which, is, which is 2.9 billion US dollars uh, this year. And it has been distributed uh, across these, uh, these six, uh, six pillars that I said, and 25 ministries are involved. In addition, there is a climate change trust fund in which every year some money is put. And this year it's about 23, 24 million US dollars equivalent, 200 crore taka. So we have that. In addition, uh, there are other projects where there's a climate component. So I don't know the exact amount. Nobody knows actually that, that that's a matter of research. So it will be about four, four and a half billion US dollars on climate. But the problem, as you said, that the spending of it, spending of it sometimes in Bangladesh, we have the we have the goal set, we have the program, but somehow in implementation, uh, we don't get the results that uh, we in fact aimed for. Uh, it's not, not necessarily corruption, but it's inaction. That may also be uh, considered as, as, as one kind of corruption. But, uh, there are projects uh, which have been implemented very well as well. So it's not all uh, black or all white. Exactly. It's, it's a mixed bag and it's everywhere in the world. Uh, all around the world, I think that, that happens. Uh, no, no, no country in the world is very clean, uh, on not only climate change, but on, on other actions. So we have good, good budget, as, I, as you say, uh, mentioned. Um, but one of the things that we are now struggling with is uh, prioritization. Mm. Is which action first and which action next? That's one of the problems here. So we have- uh, fact, I, I'll be coming to that because privatization and in, uh, in, along with that, this huge, because Bangladesh is increasing economically very rapidly. And whether are you compromising with the environmental agendas down the line, that's very interesting to know from you. I'll be coming to you on that. But let me uh, let me let me go to first uh, Ms. Khadija, the Deputy Minister in Maldives. Madam, your situation is different. Uh, your threat of climate change is definitely in all the countries also there. But you are just smaller country, and how you see? Because you are a politician among this whole group. You are the only one who is a practicing politician. So you have to balance and juggle between your concern as an environmentalist and also your kind of responsibilities and role as a politician. So how do you see that? But very interesting to note on the outset, let me let me share with the audience that in Maldives, the budget for environment is bigger than the budget of defense. That is something I really, really feel I mean, an extremely positive thing. Let's let go over to Madam uh, Khadija for your comment, please. Thank you. And, and thank you for having me for, um, for this important discussion. So first, I would like to say that the Maldives, uh, we, uh, our new government was well, not so new now. It's been two years since uh, we came into um, the government. And um, we have recently set the new uh, ambitious national strategies and action plans to address climate change, adaptation and mitigation. So the president has announced our aim to reach net zero by 2030, which is a very, very ambitious goal for a small country like us. And the point of it is not that we, we of course, need in, in intense amount of um, resources and aid and help from all of our partners and, and our friends. But uh, the point is that we, we want to make sure that we reflect this kind of climate, uh, climate uh, change thinking in all of our sectors. So it does not only concern the environment ministry. So the environment ministry's budget is about 5% of our total budget and, and it is bigger than the defense uh, budget because climate change and the environmental sector is very, very important. But I would also like to say that if you, um, if you look at um, some other panelists also highlighted the adaptation side of things, a lot of the infrastructure projects, a lot of the the hard engineering uh, projects by the government, these are all uh, could be counted as adaptation because this includes things like coastal protection, building of 
harbors, building of new ports, and um, in, in making more consolidated um, urban living spaces, um, uh, connecting, connecting different um, islands through better transportation, things like this. This is supposed to increase the resilience of the community. So this another way of looking at the budget could uh, actually say that we could actually say that we are putting putting our money into uh, mainstreaming climate change, um, and 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 um, and one thing that uh, the Ministry of Finance has uh, begun working on is creating a national. Um, national financing framework and institutional setup because as you know we are also a SIDS country and we do not have um, we do not have uh, very good um, systems in place still uh, we are working on it so we want to make sure that we have more better um, coordination between in between the ministries and between our donors and also that we don't lose we don't lose funds doing uh, the same projects uh, or double counting and and we ensure that our money is not lost on things like corruption um, uh, and, and I, on this note I'd also like to highlight that we the Maldives had been ranked better in our in transparency International's um, uh, uh, CPI uh, this year, so we have jumped uh, 14 places, I believe, and and so we still have a long way to go in ga gaining more public confidence uh, in in the way that we are spending our national budget. But I believe that that we're making the small steps to go towards uh, a, a cleaner, uh, more environmentally friendly future. While I also acknowledge we still have a lot of room for improvement and in um, uh, and, and, and a lot of work to be done. But uh, but from the politics aspect, I'll, I would like to say that we have our willpower in the right direction. And now we have to met, met, materialize our goals. And of course, uh, people might say, think that, oh, achieving net zero is like really far-fetched and, um, or oh, there's always going to be corruption. There's always going to be money, <laughs> um, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> Correctly, but I think that the first step uh, in the first step by a government in in trying in 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 changing the direction into the right um, right manner is a, a big achievement. So, and, 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 and I think, going... Madam, what helps Maldives? What helps Maldives? That the major livelihoods and the major professions, number of major professions, maybe fishery, maybe tourism, they are like those which do not really impact the environment per se. That might be an additional advantage for Maldive, country like Maldive, because you, you are kind of having those kind of issues there. So it's great to hear from you that government is going the right direction, as you said, might be, will be speeding up in future and with Glasgow coming up, we all expect uh, uh, the big countries to follow model like Maldive. I'll come back to you, madam, but let me let me go to Nilanjan. Nilanjan is very interesting to note from two smaller countries from the region, two things. We are talking about money to start with, but now let's go to the mindset. Money is an issue, but mindset I think is the bigger issue. Bangladesh, uh, Professor Ahmed said, and also uh, the Honorable Minister from Maldives said that they have an integration of the ministries to work on the environmental issues. But even in our country, the environmental department's right wing doesn't know what's happening in the left wing. And as she said, that, uh, uh, that the whole issue of the hard infrastructure also having an adaptation angle. So how you see, it's not about money, Nilanjan, it's all also about mindset. What's your take on that? It's absolutely about mindset. First of all, there is no acknowledgement in here that uh, climate change is a developmental problem. Climate Despite change. the fact that India is one of the hugely impacted, highest impacted exactly. climate change countries in the world. Exactly. Climate change is not an environmental problem. Climate change is a developmental problem. It affects the environment and again, it creates a dent on development in the medium and the long run. So eventually, just as uh, Madam Minister uh, rightly mentioned, uh, Professor Kazi also mentioned, in fact, this is uh, very critical, that uh, mainstreaming climate change in the developmental paradigm as such, so, it's, it's, no, it's not a concern of the Ministry of Environment and Forests. Why should it be a concern of the Ministry of Environment and Forests? This is as much of a concern of Ministry of Commerce. It is as much of a concern of Ministry of Finance. It is as much of a concern for the Ministry of uh, 
uh, uh, Ministry of Roads and Infrastructure. So the issue in here is that that we are essentially divorcing climate change from mm -hmm. development. It is as if that uh, this entire uh, concern of environment is divorced from development, but that is not the case. Essentially, development and environment they are they go hand in hand. Uh, the, the critical developmental forces are causing these uh, issues of climate change, and eventually they have to combat it uh, through 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 some modes of adaptation and mitigation, which which we have have been discussed many a time. Nilanjan, so, you are saying you are so, saying that the ministries, other ministries, should also be concerned about climate change or environment. Is, but what we see, is, no, no, what we see, other ministries what, are pushing the environment okay. ministries to clear the project. Hundreds of them in one day. So this, this other is, round, uh, actually. This is an issue of fragmented governance. Hmm. Fragmented development governance. This is that's all I can say. Absolutely. Let's let's bring Onumita Onumita here. Onumita, uh, just taking a cue from what uh, Madam Minister said and Nilanjan reiterated, is that see we are having the huge infrastructure uh, kind of push this year. I understand that post COVID we need to put money into that so that employment is generated, the economy comes back, that's fine. But my, my concern is that while doing that infrastructure is free, aren't we going to compromise with the environmental safeguards? You, all, you only mentioned in the initiation that the environmental safeguards, for example, the Green Bench, the National Green Tribunal, it started all over the country, but now reduced to only Delhi. So basically these are all being diluted. So if you just join the dots on Amita, we are not for a happy time. What's your take? Absolutely. So this whole push for road building, I mean, that's what we see as a major thrust and infrastructure overall. So clearly we know that that's going to create huge pressure for clearing uh, forest, for you know, cutting trees, getting into ecological sensitive areas. And we are again going to get, in, get caught in that battle of uh, you know, ecology versus development, which is a very wrong um, way of uh, looking at it. So if we have to take infrastructure approach, it is important to then uh, understand that what should be the infrastructure design that will not lock in carbon, but unlock. And in fact, not uh, you know, give you more sustainable solutions. That should have been the idea. So from that perspective, the question that you were asking first, whether it's a question of money or mindset. But this is also, it's very interesting. It's always not just about whether you have allocated enough money for environment or not. Mm -hmm. There are also a whole range of distortions in our fiscal policy, which also works against the environment. Now, for instance, today, you take the whole debate on coal. So at one level, you have lowered the safeguard on uh, environmental safeguard on coal, you have allowed commercialization of coal, and we are all fearing the whole influx of cheap coal in the industrial sector today. But when we are trying to push for clean energy transition in the industrial sector, what we are up against is that clean fuel is more expensive than coal. That is natural yes. gas more expensive than coal. So industrial use of natural gas is getting limited. Just because of this one distortion that coal is under GST and therefore low tax and natural gas is outside GST and state governments can liberally impose their own local taxes on uh, natural gas. And because of this, we are seeing huge distortion and we are not being able to replace coal with cleaner fuels. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we tax the bus higher than the car, okay? I mean, so it's all this- So whole, whole mindset, as you said, mindset. At the same time, this budget, very categorically, there's a line saying that the budget is going to promote construction, control of construction and demolition waste. Damn, yes. very good. But one of the critical strategy of CND waste is to recycle the CND and bring that product recycle product back into construction. Exactly. But we know that under GST, the recycled CNG product is taxed higher than the standard material. So whole, therefore we, you need an absolute clear
cleaning up of the fiscal regime. Absolutely, I think the polluted paper. We, we are we are patting the wrong shoulders. We are patting the wrong shoulders. Niranjan, are you trying to say adding anything very quickly before yeah, I yeah, go up? Yeah, yeah, to... yeah. Just, just to what uh, Mr. Aishwarya mentioned, this is ex extremely critical. Uh, I just wanted to uh, stress on, uh, on 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 the on the same lines. In fact. Uh, particularly when the FM emphasized the need for uh, the professionally managed development financial institutions, which is mm -hmm. supposed to act as uh, some kind of a provider, enabler and uh, catalyst for infrastructure uh, financing. And uh, there is, a, there is a, supposedly a bill to set up uh, this DFI with a provision of, uh, I presume, around uh, 20,000 crore INR to capitalize the institution. Now, as a geostrategic move, this can be a great move because this financing agency can actually far, even, even fund projects outside India, maybe in Myanmar or any other place, just that, like the AIIB is doing for China. However, the issue is that whether like other global DFIs, development financial institutions, uh, it, it is important that such infrastructure lending agencies, they should keep in their ambit the concern of sustainability. Mm, as as uh, actually point. mentioned, that often infrastructure projects infringe into the working of the natural ecosystem, like linear infrastructure, like roads running through the protected areas, and eventually the society I, pays in the long run for the losses in the. I, I remember, I remember about uh, about fifteen years back, uh, West Bengal, uh, West Bengal in, in the eastern part of India, uh, from where I and Nilanjan uh, are part of, and Onumita was actually proud of at, at one point of time. Uh, a huge amount was came from World Bank for improvement of tramways. Kolkata is the only city in India which is having the continuous tramways. Now that's a different story. But what I'm trying to say here that I was doing a kind of a research come story on that, and I find that 99% of the funds which came for tramways was actually invested for building houses for the tram company. Nothing for the tramways per se, nothing for the line, nothing for the track, nothing for the overhead, mainly for building up good houses where the officials can have lovely offices and like that. So that's the way I think the, when you're talking about sustainability, those things are coming up. Let's go to let's go to Bangladesh and the, then the answer that remained incomplete last time. Uh, I really would like to know adequately on that. Professor Ahmed, Bangladesh is on course for a financial jump. We all are reading about how Bangladesh is improving financially and within a few years you are going to go to the next pedestal. Now my, my only question to you that in this hurry to reach that level, both the infrastructure boom coupled with the privatization, you were mentioning about privatization, what's your expectation? Are you, are you taking enough safeguards on that line to save environment and climate change? Professor Ahmed. I didn't say privatization, it was prioritization. You know, okay. which one you do first and which one you do. Oh, so prioritization. Okay. Anyway. That, that, that was that was thing I was talking about. Of course, there is a there is a cost. When you develop, uh, environment is going to be affected and is affected. Yeah. We have pollution, water pollution, air pollution, and all of those, and also cutting of trees, um, forest trees, and even cutting of the hills as well. That's that is happening. So that's that's a, that's that's the cost there, but we are mindful because we have the policies, right policies, and also there is a there is a committee set up in the prime minister's office. Prime minister is very keen on sustainable development, which includes environmental protection and enhancement both. So there is a committee there. They prepared uh, the the um, uh, roadmap for implementing SDG, where climate change and environment feature very prominently. They identify the priority areas and on the SDG, not the, not, not the other thing, on the SDG, which are the, uh, which are the targets that are more relevant for Bangladesh. They identify okay. those and climate, climate is there. Eight five-year plan also has. But now the coordination, I was, uh, I was uh, talking about 25 ministries involved in it and they are all, uh, they have all monies. And they have their units as well. In all the ministries, there is the there is the environment and climate change unit. In all the small though. Uh, the larger coordination, there I think there is a problem. Uh, when uh, one ministry is doing something uh, from their own budget, not the climate budget, from their own budget, they don't uh, don't take into account 
uh, that some of the ministers might might be involved in them. They, they may be damaging something oh, which they should not have done. So these uh, these are the issues. I think the coordination issue is one. Uh, prioritization is the issue is another. Money uh, on the amount is quite large. It's it's about four four billion, but maybe even more. But we need much more. Even during the COVID time, we had uh, Amphang cyclone, and we had three consecutive floods. And every year we have, and many people are affected. We build inter infrastructure, and then one cyclone it goes away. It's going, and so every year almost one part of the country or the other is affected. And therefore, this money, in the context of the need, is not that much. Exactly. So the, here, 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 there is a problem, and here the international financing comes into into the picture and not much is available. You know, the one other thing I should correct also, the, the funding that we have for climate is not 7.5%, some newspapers, it's actually 4.3%. Uh, okay, the yeah. document that I received mentioned 7.5%. No, that's, that's not correct. I saw that. So almost 4.4%? 4. 4. 4.3 percent. Okay, 4.3 percent. Okay. It is 3 billion out of 67 billion. Okay, so okay, okay. Uh, in fact, uh, as Professor so, Ahmed, you were pointing out that you need more. Definitely, you need more because obviously, obviously, obviously. because if you look at the if you look at the recent German Watch report, which talks about the long-term vulnerability and the cost of climate change, Bangladesh happens to be on the top five. So, uh, definitely, Bangladesh needs a lot of more funds, but. You are already having some funds and you are working very well with the ministries involved. But one supplementary question, there are questions being raised about your rumpel and other issues. How you juggle that? that that's a very critical, when you talk about own side, the adaptation, um, climate, um, and you was having rumpel, how you juggle that? Question is, rumpel is very close to Sundarbans. That's the critical question. That's the point. We don't, we don't emit much. We, we emit per capita less than one third of a ton of carbon. Uh, per year, which is one seventh of the average of developing countries and one thirteenth of the average, global average. So we don't emit much. Uh, the main problem is, is Sundarbans. Uh, there are arguments on both sides. The, those who prepare projects, they argue one way and others argue that it is going to impact on the, on the Sundarbans. Which has protected us from Ampan from every year. It protects exactly. us. That we, we need that. Yeah, that's a question that has that is being discussed here. And also now it may not happen because coal is mm -hmm. going to be not exactly. available. Uh, so so that, by, that's by that's not by maybe by design, but by default. Not, so that by default probably it won't, won't by happen. default perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Finger so crossed it. Great. But if uh, we have uh, we have. I'm. I, I'm the coordinator of the of the BCC asset okay. uh, the Bangladesh Climate Change uh, Strategy and Action Plan. We are preparing. So we have an overview. That's what I'm trying to say. We have an overview. What we need to do, and we need uh, the money that is uh, the government can provide. It provides. And there's very uh, specific money that provided to the trust fund also. So I am also I'm all, I all, I'm also a member of the trust fund. So okay. we allocate very specific uh, for very specific actions. In specific I, I believe there's also a committee being formed, including uh, NGOs, independent experts, to look after the climate funding. So that committee has been no, formed. That, that, that was a suggestion by by civil society. Oh, not really, not really uh, on ground. No. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll come back to you. In all the committees, government set up, sets up. There are one okay. or two or three represented from civil society. Okay. And okay. there's some, I, I sit on several committees. Actually. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take your point on the Glasgow. That's the final question. But before that, let me go over to again Maldives. Madam Minister, uh, you have heard how the other countries in the region are working. And as you said, that your, your government, the new government has been working, uh, kind of considering environment is a premier thing. Now, but at the same time, you are issue, having issues with the kind of infrastructure. So how do you plan to go ahead? Because you have limited resources and other limitations. So how you how will you try to prioritize the issues like environment, climate change in the overall political paradigm in your country? So 
so first of all um our whole uh, government vision is uh has been uh, detailed out in our strategic action plan of the Maldivian uh of the of the president's office and um but however like because of covid we have to of course take stock of our priorities and really try to focus on our on, on rebuilding our economy and and ensuring that while we do it we also do it in an environmental and sustainable way so so that exercise has been done and now we have a national recovery and resilience framework in which we have again further re prioritized our our projects and in it one of the one of the main uh, or one of the main uh, pledges and also one of the main uh, a, a main goal of the government is ensuring um, ensuring that we have the uh, safe um, infrastructure on on islands with regards to water so water and sanitation is I uh, saw the lot of funding in the housing sector a lot of funding in the housing yes, yes. Uh, there's, there's, infrastructure so a lot so of funding is there so there's the housing there's also um water and infrastructure which is a really big thing then we have a transport network okay. and, the, and we have some big uh, infrastructure projects so now our challenge would be to ensure that these infrastructure projects have the right environmental safeguards and that all of our projects ensure minimal damage okay. to the environment of course this is very very um uh, this is very uh difficult considering that um it, it's a challenge to us because uh of course we are uh, on uh, we are relying entirely on our coral reef system here and this is the, the this is uh our everything our base of life um basically for fishing and and tourism sector we need okay. to ensure that our Madam, just just a kind of a quick question that are you getting are you getting uh, adequate support from the say the international institutions like uh, Green Climate Fund or Global Adaptation Fund? Are you getting yeah. funds? Are you getting supports? No, uh, I don't. Not think, really? I don't think it's, it's, it's I think uh, of course we are very grateful and happy for the support we get, but I don't think that this is enough. For example, uh, for example, I could say that our green climate uh, fund, uh, we uh -huh. have developed a pipeline for $500 million. Uh, and so what, now what we'll need is from our partners to turn these uh, funding proposals into um, access for GCF and other funds. And also in part of the disaster, disaster management uh, and loss and damage aspect, um, I would also like to highlight, for example, coastal erosion addressing coastal erosion in the Maldives is uh, would cost up to up to 8.8 billion US dollars which is a very significant amount amount for us in fact that is four times our entire uh, approved national budget and so we have we have this big hurdle in accessing the finance and one thing that I would really like to highlight is uh, that we need uh, the procedures to access donor support are very very complex and it is that and we we have have severe capacity uh, constraints okay. with, uh, in, in national institutions. So we are unable to afford the paperwork required to complete project proposals and uh, in, in doing and in, in having uh, everything in excess, ac acceptable standard to the funds. Okay. And, 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 and because our academia is not yet developed enough for us to provide, um, you know, local level scientific data and other 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 information. Other things. Uh, Absolutely. I'll, I'll come back to a final question about the Glasgow. That's the, I'll be requiring a one line answer. But before that, let's have a quick round. And I think the final round, uh, let's start with Dilanjan. Dilanjan, this budget, Indian budget, has 30 crores for the Climate Action Plan. And I know for sure, West Bengal government's Climate Action Plan, the budget they prepared is a 36,000 crore. So it's it's hilarious. It's ridiculous. So. With Glasgow coming up, we have certain commitments out there and with this ambition to be taken up all over the world, including India, how do you see that this going up in the international level? Are we kind of uh, chalk and cheese to me at this point of time? Uh, uh, Quickly, we have just uh, about seven, eight minutes. De uh, de definitely figures, figures don't add up. They don't reflect on uh, as far as the commitments are concerned. No doubt about that. So this is something that I already mentioned. It doesn't make any sense. 30 crores, that's ridiculous. 
but uh, yes we have to move ahead this is as as in fact mr ashwari mentioned that this is a po- you know a post lockdown kind of a budget where you have to revive the economy but yes one very critical element was the green recovery the green revival that's what that's what we needed and in some way or the other of course uh, one very critical element was the green re- why essentially we use the term green revival or the green recovery was that uh, the, the zoonosis element especially the biological control of the ecosystem so that 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 doesn't get disturbed but at the same time we simply cannot ignore this international commitment this has essentially catapulted the economy years back if this is this is what where we are so uh, by all means we have to plug in i don't know i'm i'm not bothered about what our international commitments are let us look at what our commitments are to our own humanity so uh, climate change by all means have to be integrated in our development vision absolutely nirajan you know and i know about sundarbans in indian sundarbans and professor amit knows that in indian sundarbans there is about 4.5 million people who are having the kind of a, a poverty ratio which is double than the national average i think similar in bangladesh at 7.5 million people live in the sundarban influence zone so about 13 million together which is which is bigger than many countries in europe and uh, my only humble question to the government is when you are talk taking a budget what does 5 million people get what the resi- are you contributing anything to the resilience when the next ampan will hit them are will, will they be in a better position to come back i'm afraid the answer is not yes as for now so that's that's where the question mark arises on with the very quickly with yeah. with the international commitments and everything how you perceive this is the trend to continue very quickly so very clear the air pollution sector no so very clearly john to keeping the international commitment in mind so far we have been complacent because our overall ndc commitments we are saying we have almost met it exactly but also because our ambition is certainly not as high but now there's going to be pressure for enhanced ambition enhanced ndc right mm-hmm. now that's the preparedness that we require so very quickly the message for us is that we now need some fiscal maturity keeping in mind that only command and control is a very archaic way of dealing with environmental impacts we need to give fiscal signals and madam uh, minister who is here i was so impressed few years ago when i saw that in maldive for your vehicle import policy you have emission based taxation you know that you had earlier i mean something that we haven't even started doing in india only exactly. we have little bit of that so it's clear what i'm saying that our fiscal regime now has to account for the cost of environment and also the benefit of taking uh, you know uh, doing a uh, taking an ambitious action that's how other air quality regulators around the world world they work so they account for the cost but they also account for the benefit to justify Both. the cost so mm-hmm. let's have a new fiscal regime to tax the bad and fund the good and also unumita i feel that we need some continuity and consistency in our policy when you were doing the air pollution thing or in the climate thing you just can't have a reasonable budget in one year then slides down because whatever you were investing all goes to not i'm not an economist but as a common sense person i understand that this theory doesn't work even in economics i think professor ahmed and nilayan can uh, yes, definitely will agree with me that exactly. this is what from that kind of funding is right that uh, is- with election coming up you are fund suddenly funding and with the covid coming up you are funding 137% excess on health and uh, you have to wait for a climate disaster to fund 150% so the uh, are you bolting the horse in the right time is the question to be asked i think that's i'm not sure about it professor ahmed on bangladesh point of view uh, I, we know that in bangladesh the climate is a very very big issue and uh, with glasgow coming up how you see you are part of various committees you are far part of the bangladesh strategic plan uh, what the bangladesh is going to uh, kind of do or feeling like in context to glasgow you you feel about it well, i think we will go there with a new strategy and action plan okay uh what we will do and what uh, what what the uh, what the scenario looks like and what we can do we'll have that but internationally what at least um, i believe because i have been a negotiator for a long time it has to be mitigation global mitigation if that doesn't happen bangladesh or any other country even indian coasts and other other areas will be uh, affected severely with salinization and then 
um, storm surges and all of those. So therefore, this is one of the things that we'll be highlighting that that needs to be done. Now with the uh, United States back again, probably some- uh, Some funds will come up. Uh, not only, yeah, I think that uh, the, uh, the other developed countries will get uh, some support from there as well. That they have so you're hopeful, here. you're hopeful. They're, 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 uh, um, yes, um, uh, cautiously hopeful, hopeful perhaps. With question mark. With question with mark. Question mark. We go, we go, if you go there with great hope, then you may be frustrated. So we go with question We know, we know what happened in Copenhagen. We know what happened in other various others where yes. people go with hoping again and almost right. uh, yes. lost so, all hopes after that. Go there prepared, go there prepared and um, hope for the best. Let's see. Madam Minister, for, for Maldives, how important is Glasgow and what kind of hope and expectation with that you will be going to Glasgow? Uh, well, I think I think we are very, we have to be very hopeful because we are at this juncture where only being hopeful and, and, and planning and, and knowing what to ask for will get will get us out of this climate crisis, in my opinion. So so we are hopeful and, and, and as we have seen the unprecedented scale of the responses and recovery packages worldwide on COVID recovery demonstrates the transformational power of ambitious actions. So we need to apply the same sort of urgency to the climate crisis as well. And, um, and I think is the first step the Maldives has declared our intentions on raising our ambition on NDC. Of course, even if our mitigation um, contribution is negligible, we, 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 uh, we're treating this as uh, not only from the mitigation aspect, but on adaptation as well. And I think that once we, we, we um, flesh out an implementation plan for the NDCs, we should okay. be able to uh, prioritize and see where we need the fund. So we hope that what, by the time we go to Glasgow, we could be um, more clear on what exactly we need. Yes. And also we like to push for seeds getting uh, more uh, funds from uh, multi, uh, uh, upon MD, MDBs. For example, seeds receive only 4% of climate finance provided by the MDBs for adaptation and only okay. 7% in 2019. So this is very, very great. And if you take, uh, if you take from- Great, uh, we have to wrap up now. We have to wrap up right now. I thank you for all the information, but I, I completely share your hope because I think uh, without hope, you just, just can't go anywhere. With As uh, Professor Ahmed pointed out, he was back in the game. I hope they are back in the game. They are back, but whether they are back in the game or not, that's a different story to understand. But if, if they are back in the game and uh, the... Uh, So, and if from, from to me, apart from knowing the independent and individual scenarios across South Asia, from Maldives to Bangladesh to India, what is interesting is the yeah. learning lesson from Maldives to Onumita, Bangladesh to me. India. The, what the is kind interesting of is passes the, the learning Maldives lesson. giving an environment, and the kind of modus operandi that Dr. Ahmed was talking about, the 25 ministries working together on environmental issues, not an independent ministry like India. I think a lot to learn. I think this platform has been created. This South Asian environment dialogue being created. The, the kind of views. I think fast is the moment is given an environment. I think we have all learned and the kind of this modus operandi of working with the government of India and about the 25 and I'm ministers sure that they can also learn together on environmental issues from India. How an independent industry ministry like India is doing. Another day of the time. I think this platform has been created. This South Asian environment dialogue. For your time, we'll keep in touch. Thank you, everybody. We conclude here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. has been created to exchange views. I think no better than today. I think we have all learned how these countries are working with that and how India can learn that. And I'm sure that they can also learn a thing or two from India, how India is going about it. Welcome to but South Asia again, Environment Dialogue. Another day, another time today with this, I think a fascinating discussion. And thanks to all of you for your time. We'll keep in touch. Thank you, everybody. We conclude here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
replenished for the next harvest. To recover from this crisis, the world depends on us. We secure tomorrow's food by fertilizing crops today. To keep things growing, you can count on us. To learn more, visit us at fertilizercanada.ca slash COVID-19.